The Centre of Hearing and Deafness is a research group at the forefront of research on brain imaging and tinnitus, and we are very honoured to have him with us this evening. He will be speaking now about his research on brain imaging and tinnitus. So please welcome, all the way from the United States, Professor Richard Salvi. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to give us sort of a scientific talk today, but I'm going to try to take some of the figures and graphs and make them accessible to you. So one of the things when you have tinnitus, tinnitus is a phantom sound. Your doctor can't see it. You can see it, but you can feel it in your brain. What I'm going to show you today are some tools and techniques that scientists have developed to actually show you where tinnitus originates in your brain, both in human subjects and animal subjects. So, to begin with, I need to basically take you through the auditory system in your brain. You actually hear with your brain, not just with your ear. So let's start down here. Sounds come in and they go to a structure in your inner ear called the cochlea. In the cochlea you have some sensory cells called hair cells. And what they do is they take sounds and they convert them into neural activity. Pretty much like a microphone, like the one that I'm wearing. Once that electrical activity comes out of the hair cells, it's relayed to a structure called the auditory nerve. This nerve has about 50,000 nerve fibers in it. It's like a transmission line. It sends us into your brain. It actually goes through a canal through your skull and delivers it into a region of the brain called the cochlear nucleus. In the cochlear nucleus, the sound is processed and starts to get interpreted then it's sent over to another structure called the superior olivary complex. And then it goes up to the midbrain over here called the inferior colliculus. Next stage, it goes up to the medial geniculate body. And finally, it gets up to the auditory cortex. The auditory cortex on the side of your brain over here. This is where sounds like music, language get interpreted. That's the final endpoint in the auditory pathway. However, that doesn't end here. That information that you get in your auditory pathway gets relayed to different parts of the nervous system. And this has been largely ignored by auditory neuroscientists probably for the past 20 years, but they're starting to become interested in it. One of the things that happens, some of that information goes to an area of the brain called the hippocampus. This is a part of the brain where memories are formed. When you go to the shopping uh, to buy your groceries and you park your car in the parking lot and you come out of the shopping store, the store, you have to remember where your car is and one of the ways you do that is with the hippocampus. It helps to form memories of things and auditory information is relayed there. There's another part of your brain called the amygdala. The amygdala is a part of your brain where sounds, sensory events, get attached to emotion. If your wife yells at you, this part of the brain gets activated. When a baby cries, this is part of the brain gets highly activated. There's another part of the brain called the reticular formation. This is an arousal area. You could be sleeping, your alarm clock goes off. This is one of the things that gets activated, wakes you up, when the alarm goes off. And finally, the last part I'm going to talk about is the cerebellum. Cerebellum is at the back of your head over here. It's thought to be involved in motor planning. You go to a uh, restaurant and somebody announces your name, you hear the sound, and you have to move your head over in the direction of your, where you think the sound is coming from, and your cerebellum helps to guide that movement. So you have to remember all of that, because we're going to come back to that at the end of my talk. So I'll start over here. This is your ear canal. All of you can see that on yourself and other human beings. Sounds are relayed down to your eardrum. They move these bones over here, the middle ear ossicles, and deliver the sound into the structure we call the cochlea. 
This looks like a snail-shaped structure. It's oriented horizontally. Sounds at our low frequencies are coded over here. Sounds at our high frequencies are coded in this region. Sort of like a piano keyboard. Low sounds are on the, so on the left side of the piano, high sounds are on the right. So this structure helps to separate the sounds into its various components. And then its re information from the sensory hair cells are relayed out from the auditory nerve and they go into the brain. Now one reason for showing you this slide over here is that it's taught us a lot about tinnitus. Sometimes individuals get a tumor that grows on this auditory nerve. It's called an acoustic neuroma or vestibular schwannoma. And people that have acoustic neuromas or vestibular schwannomas often develop tinnitus and it can be quite severe. What happens to remove this, at least in the old days, a surgeon would go in, open up the skull, and go and remove this tumor. If the tumor was very large, in most cases the people would lose their hearing in this ear when the tumor was removed. This ear would go completely deaf because no sound would come out of it. The blood supply was cut off. After you remove the tumor, the tinnitus didn't go away. Uh, it would persist. And that helped to explain something. When I was a graduate student, people used to think that tinnitus originated in your ear from some hyperactivity in the nerve. We never could see that as scientists, the hyperactivity. Uh, but that was a theory that tinnitus originated in your ear, the tinnitus generator was there, and if you cut the nerve, in theory, you should get rid of the tinnitus generator and the tinnitus would go away. In more than 50% of the people, if you do this, the tinnitus persists. So that led to a major change in our thinking about where tinnitus originated. The conventional wisdom now, probably accepted by most of the scientific community, is that tinnitus is not generated in your ear. You could perceive it there, but it's actually generated somewhere in your brain. So that led us to do a series of experiments to try to identify where the tinnitus generators might reside. Before I get into tinnitus, I want to talk to you about another debilitating condition that's often associated with tinnitus, and that's called hyperacusis. Hyperacusis is a condition where everything sounds way too loud to you. Uh, when you get older, you go to a restaurant, look over at your wife and say, it's really loud in here, isn't it, dear? And she'll say, yes, it is, okay. And oftentimes that's a precursor of getting tinnitus, or hyperacusis. Hyperacusis has a prevalence of around 9%. If you have hyperacusis, there's up to an 86% chance that you'll also have tinnitus. If you're a tinnitus patient, there's probably about to a 40% chance that you'll have hyperacusis. So hyperacusis is a very common phenomenon. It's not only common because of hearing loss, you see this in a lot of other neurological diseases. You see it in autism. People with autism don't like loud sounds or bright lights. You see it in fibromyalgia. You see it in a lot of chronic pain syndromes, as well as other neurological diseases. So it's not just a hearing loss problem. It's associated with many other neurological problems. So how can we test for somebody that has hyperacusis? We could take them to an audiology clinic and we could set them down in the sound booth and we can turn the sound level up on the audiometer and ask the patient, tell us when the sound becomes uncomfortably loud to you. And over here, if you do this in a normal group of patients, around 100 dB hearing level, they would say things are just too loud. So over here, I was just out in California, gave a talk at a meeting there, and uh, there was a meeting with the Hyperacusis Research Foundation, and one of the guys that was sitting there was a lawyer who does financial planning, and this is our, his uncomfortable loudness levels. If you play a sound, this low frequency, like 125 to 250 hertz, sounds around 40 to 50 dB, sounds that you get in a quiet room are too loud. If you play sounds around high frequencies, 1,000, 2,000, and 4,000, his uncomfortable loudness levels rise to about 75 dB. So at this 
banquet that I was at, this person had ear protectors in during the entire banquet and had headphones over that to protect his hearing. That's how sensitive he was. So this can really be a debilitating condition. One of the good things about talking to tinnitus patients is you learn things about the condition that you as a scientist didn't know existed. So I went to a tinnitus support group meeting about 25 or 30 years ago, and as I gave, I got done giving my talk there, some of the patients uh, got up and said, Dr. Selby, when I clench down on my teeth, uh, my tinnitus gets louder, and I kind of looked out there in disbelief. Another person got up, when I stick my tongue out, my tinnitus gets quieter. I said, oh my God, are these people really telling me the truth? And I went back, after three or four more people told me this, I went back to the person I was doing the brain imaging studies with, and I said, we're going to change our experimental design, we're going to find these people who can manipulate their tinnitus, and we're going to have them go in the imaging device and have them make their tinnitus louder or quieter and see what happens to their, goes on in their brain. So we did some studies what's called PET imaging. To do this type of brain imaging, you give patients a radioactive tracer. We would give them radioactive water, and the water would go to parts of the brain that are really biologically active. So we could see what parts of the brain would get activated when their tinnitus got turned on or when, when it went off. And these people would go in there and clench their jaw, not as vigorously as this, they would just clench down very lightly, and that was sufficient to either make their tinnitus quieter or louder. But we'd do three types of brain scans on them. We did a resting brain scan so we could see what their tinnitus, what their brain activity was like. Then we could have them do this oral facial maneuver, and if the tinnitus got louder, we could see where the blood flow went up, and if the tinnitus got quieter, we could see where the brain activity went down. And then we did one other thing. We played a sound to them, 2,000 hertz telling them around 80 dB. And when we did this, we learned a whole bunch of things. So the first thing we did, we took some normal hearing people and we played sounds to them of 2,000 hertz, presented at 80 dB, and these are brain images of, of, brain images of human brain, you can see where the activity picked up. So here's a side view of the brain over here. This area in red is the part of the brain that was activated when the 2000 hertz tone was presented. You can see it was activated on the left side of the brain, it was also activated on the right side of the brain. The part of the brain that got activated is called the auditory cortex, and that's exactly where you expect the sound to get activated. So you can see this on the coronal sections here, and also on this horizontal section. So the thing for you to remember about this figure over here is that when you put a sound just in one ear, what happens, it activates both the left and the right auditory cortex. That's the only thing you need to remember for that. So then we took some patients that had the, uh, could modulate their tinnitus with this oral facial maneuver. And one of the patients, when they clenched on their jaw, the tinnitus would get louder. And two of the patients, the tinnitus would get quieter when they presented that. And then we would ask a statistical question. We would say, when the tinnitus changes, when it either gets louder and when it gets quieter, what part of the brain changes when that occurs? And this is what showed up. When these people clenched their jaw, we saw activity changing in the left auditory cortex over here. We saw it also changing in the medial geniculate body. We also saw it changing in the left hippocampus. But if you look at these sections over here, you saw that the activity only changed on one side of the brain. And the reason that's important, if the tinnitus was originating in the inner ear, and it flowed into the central nervous system, it should have activated both the left and the right side of the brain. So this is a clue to us that tinnitus wasn't originating in the ear, but rather was originating somewhere in the brain. So the second important point of this study was that a part of the brain that got activated is the limbic system. This was mentioned by the mayor of Guilford just a few minutes ago. Uh, the limbic system gets activated when you're anxious or nervous. 
And this is the first study of its kind ever to show that the limbic system got activated. Many patients who have tinnitus basically are really uh, distraught about that. I'm going to show you one other thing from the human studies that was really quite interesting and totally unexpected by us. We played a sound, 2000 hertz, 80 dB to the right ear, same as we did for the normal human subjects. What we found is that when we played this sound and we compared it to the activity in the, hum the normal subjects, we got more brain activity. So this area over here shows you where the tinnitus patients, when we played the sound, their brains were more active than a normal brain. It's like their brains were hyperactive when we played the sounds to them. We found that the hyperactivity, again, was in the auditory cortex, primary auditory cortex, and another area of the brain called Brodmann area 38. This is an area that seems to get activated when you hear aversive auditory stimuli, emotional sounds. So this, again, played into the idea that when you have tinnitus, you not only hear the sound, but it can actually be, cause hyperactivity in your brain. I'm an auditory neuroscientist. Most of my patients are mice and rats. Okay? And it's really difficult to communicate with mice and rats. You have to develop special tools and techniques to figure this out. And one of the reasons you'd like to study tinnitus and hyperacusis in animal models you can look at the biological basis. You can do drug manipulations. You can try to identify drugs that might be used to treat both of these disorders. So one of the things we developed is an animal model to measure tinnitus. This is an extremely difficult thing to do. I won't go into the details, but the way it works, you train rats that are deprived of water to lick when they hear a so when there's, when there's no sound, it has to be quiet, you can have a drink. And if there's any noise going on, you're not allowed to drink. So you can see two sets of behaviors here. When it's, when it's quiet out, the animal makes two to 3,000 licks during this one testing period. And then when it's, the sound comes on, the rat stops licking. Now there's really a good way to induce tinnitus, an extremely reliable way. We know this from human studies. Back in the 1940s and 1950s, if you had rheumatoid arthritis, you would go to your rheumatologist and they would sell you, tell you, start taking high doses of aspirin. Keep increasing the dose until your ears start to ring. And then lower the dose until it stops ringing. And that's the dose that you would treat your rheumatoid arthritis with. So we know that when you take extremely high doses of this drug, you can always induce tinnitus in humans. So we tried this in animal models. So we gave a high dose of aspirin. The active ingredient is called sodium salicylate. We gave the animals 350 milligrams per kilogram. You can see the licking in the quiet interval stopped. Over here, they completely stopped licking when the quiet interval came on. And one of the reasons for that is it wasn't quiet to the rat. They were hearing the phantom sound of tinnitus. So they thought they were supposed to stop licking. We stopped giving the drug, and they start licking again. Then we give a lower dose of the drug, 150 milligrams, they stop licking. Then we take the drug away, and they stop, start licking again. Then we give them a really low dose over here, and they continue to lick. So we know what dose of the drug is capable of inducing tinnitus, and we have a nice assay for that. Hyperacusis, how do we measure something like this? So this is when sounds are too loud. How can you ask a rat to tell you when things are too loud? So the way we do this is we measure a thing called reaction time. When my wife speaks to me in a normal voice, I barely react to her. But if she yells at me, which she does quite frequently, then I react and respond very rapidly and do pretty much whatever she's asking for. You can do the same thing. You can measure the reaction time in a rat, and you can play sounds of different sound levels. These are 30 dB is a low level sound, 90 dB is a high intensity sound. And these black lines show you the way a rat would react uh, to normal as you change from 
low intensities to high intensities, the reaction times get shorter and shorter. Okay? Then what we do is we take a dose of this salicylate, aspirin, a dose that we know will induce tinnitus, we want to see if it induces hyperacusis. When we give that dose to the rat, you see that we play the sound here at 40 dB, and the rat's reaction time is longer than normal. You'd interpret that as the sound being quieter than normal, and that's reasonable because when you take a really high dose of aspirin, not only gives you tinnitus, it gives you about a 20 to 30 dB hearing loss. So that's totally predictable. But as you go higher in intensity, you can see the reaction times getting shorter and shorter. And as you get up here to 60, 70, 80, and 90 dB, the reaction times are, are shorter than they normally should be. And that's telling you that the rat is experiencing these sounds of higher intensity as being louder than normal. Okay? They're louder than normal for the rat. I'm going to skip over this slide. Okay? So, as a scientist, what you'd like to know is what the heck is going on in the brain when you give a high dose of aspirin. One of the things you can do is you can use these electrodes over here. These are multi-channel electrodes, and you can place these in different parts of the brain and record the neural activity. You can either record the neural spike discharges, or you can record the local field potentials. I'm just going to show you the data from the local field potential. Now I'm going to show you something that's completely unpredictable from what we would think if you were an engineer about how the brain works. So over here we're going to record these local field potentials. We're going to record them before we give the dose of salicylate. And then we're going to record them about two hours later when we know the animal has hyperacusis and we know the animal has tinnitus. We're going to play a sound around 70, 80, 90 dB and see how reactive the brain is. We can go down over here and record this potential called the compound action potential. It actually comes right from the inner ear. It's basically the neural activity that comes out of the auditory nerve. And when you play this sound to the rat, the neural activity coming out of your ear, going into your brain, is actually reduced by about 75%. So we've reduced the amount of neural activity going from the brain to the ear, much like a regular hearing loss would do. We then take our electrode and we move it into the brain stem. We record from an area called the cochlear nucleus. We also see a reduction there, these blue lines, and it's reduced here only about 25 to 50%. Then we go up another higher level in the brain, the inferior colliculus, about halfway up the auditory pathway. We record activity there, and you can see the activity is almost back to normal. And then we put our electrodes up in the auditory cortex, the final end stage of the processing system, and you can see the activity is even greater than it was before we gave the drug. So one way to think about this is the brain has something in it, like a hearing aid. When you damage the periphery and you reduce the neural input from the peripheral part of the ear, the brain doesn't react passively it basically takes that weak signal and starts boosting it up. And we think it's that boost to the neural signal that's going from the periphery to the brain that might create the tinnitus. Many of you get in your car, drive from one town maybe to London, there's a station here you like in Guildford, and as you go to London the station fades, and what do you do? You reach over to your radio, you turn up the volume control, and what do you do? You hear the static electricity, when the signal comes in, it's way too loud. That's about time for you to say it's going to change the station. So the brain looks like it has a gain control thing to boost weak signals from a damaged ear. A damaged ear could be damaged from an ototoxic drug, could be due to noise-induced hearing loss, or whatever. So one of the things, if you talk to, to patients that have tinnitus, and you ask them, what was it like? They say, geez, I hear this terrible ringing in my ear, and it really drives me crazy. It really makes me anxious and nervous. I get really upset about this thing. So one of the things I wanted to know is what would happen to these stress hormones when you gave animals aspirin, high dose of aspirin. So what we would do is we'd take the rats, we'd give them a high dose of aspirin, and we'd get a blood sample for them just in the first one or two minutes 
after we gave the aspirin to them, and we could measure the amount of this hormone called corticosterone, it's a stress hormone. It tells you if it's, something is stressful. You can see here when we gave low doses of this drug, the stress hormone was very low, but as we got up to higher doses of the drug, the stress hormones really started to skyrocket. So one of the things we think that's why salicylate and aspirin are such a good inducer of tinnitus, it not only causes a hearing loss, it actually creates a state of stress in the animal. And that may be one of the triggering factors for tinnitus. We have these beautiful animal models now that can tell us when they have tinnitus and when they have hyperacusis. I have some colleagues I work with in Nanjing, China, and I go over there every year. We did some studies in Nanjing where we could measure the brain activity. We could measure the spontaneous fluctuations of the brain activity. And we'll go into the details on it, but what we did is we got these measurements before we gave the animals salicylate or aspirin, and then we gave them a big dose of aspirin and got measurements afterwards, and we would basically find out where the brain activity changed. And you can see in these slides, all these red dots are parts of the brain that actually, where the activity went up in the brain after we gave the drug. So here we see changes in the cerebellum, these areas over here. This is the reticular formation. This is the inferior colliculus, an auditory part of the brain. Uh, this is basically the auditory cortex, the medial geniculate body, and the amygdala, a whole set of areas. And this is a sort of a, just a, a text file showing you again, these are all the auditory areas that got activated. You can see the areas, the emotional area, the amygdala got activated, the arousal area, the reticular formation got activated, the cerebellum changed. All of those things that I mentioned on the second slide of my talk. So when you get something like tinnitus, it's not only affecting your auditory system, it's affecting other parts of the brain, arousal, emotion, and basically uh, memory parts of the brain. So we did one other thing. I don't know if any of you are dancers over here. The technique we're using here is called functional connectivity. And basically it tells you what parts of the brain are dancing together. So over here is a graph of some work done in the motor cortex. The red line is from, the, I think, the left motor cortex. The green light line is from the right motor cortex. It's basically showing me the activity between the left and the right motor cortex. And they're highly correlated. You'd need that if you wanted to do some dancing. So what we did is we used this technique, functional connectivity, to try to see what would happen to the brain of these rats when we gave them this aspirin. How would functional connectivity change? So there's one set of data from that, uh, those animals. We put a measurement tool in the auditory cortex, and we looked to see what the auditory cortex was dancing with. And the auditory cortex was dancing with the cerebellum over here, the reticular formation, that's an arousal area. It was dancing nicely with another part of the brain, the medial geniculate body, and it was also dancing or coordinated activity with the inferior colliculus. So these areas are not only getting hyperactive, but their activity is correlated between these areas. So from these animals models, we can develop kind of a, a more generalized model of what we think is going on when you have at least salicylate-induced tinnitus. We see networks in the brain that look like they become very hyperactive. These are all part of the auditory network, the auditory cortex, the medial geniculate, and the inferior colliculus. It's just not your auditory system that is becoming activated. You also see activity in the hippocampus. This is the memory part of your brain. It tells you where you parked your car when you go to the market. The amygdala, an emotional part of the brain. The reticular formation, the arousal area, the thing that makes you anxious. And also the cerebellum. When you hear a sound, you have to coordinate your movement of your head. So there's been a tremendous amount of progress made in studying tinnitus. 
In the old days, you would go to your doctor and say, your ENT doctor, and say, I have tinnitus. And the doctor would say, how do I know you have tinnitus? There was no way, objectively, of determining where tinnitus originated. These imaging tools have given us techniques now where you can, at least in small groups of subjects, you can figure out where tinnitus might originate in your brain. These are mainly research tools right now, but I wouldn't be surprised in the next 10 or 15 years if these tools could be used to do individual diagnosis of tinnitus and hyperacusis in patients. Thank you.